Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kirtan. He is a dear friend of mine. Actually, we have been co-residents. So thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Deepak and Dr. Rutul sir for giving this opportunity to uh, share my views on GDM screening and diagnosis. And I would congratulate everybody who is working for PSD to have this innovative concept of combining all the fraternities or the faculties associated with diabetes and pregnancy. So uh, going in with screening and diagnosis, we would be having few slides which would be overlapping with uh, Dr. Mithali's presentation as well. So consider it a little bit of revision if possible. We know that uh, diabetes in pregnancy is something where there is onset or first recognition during pregnancy. This is in raw language. They say that diabetes happens when at least 67% of beta cell function is uh, gone, whatever reason it may be. And that would lead to insulin resistance or lower production of insulin or its impact in form of diabetes. The prevalence or uh, the global prevalence is uh, 3 to 10 percent in pregnancy. But in India, they would say that it may range from 3 to 21 to 22 percent. Again, uh, FIGO, an international association, has declared diabetes as global health priority. Why? Because one in six live births occur to female with some form of hyperglycemia. And out of those one in six, out of that one, 84% would be due to GDM. So this is a huge number. Obviously, we know that obesity and diabetes are again something that would fall in range of malnutrition. It is not just a, uh, you know, a patient being cataxic. So malnutrition is not something that would uh, uh, you know, just be concerned with the starvation or low, uh, low birth weight uh, of uh, the patient or even baby. When it comes to FIGO, uh, it has a strong stand. Why? Because the low and middle income countries account for 85% of global deliveries, 80% of global diabetes burden, and 90% of all maternal and perinatal morbidity as well as mortality. And that is why this is a huge number where we need to focus on low and middle income countries. We need to actually increase the education at the same time implementation of what we have been talking about. I mean, the conferences would be anywhere in the world, like n number of conferences, but what would be the result of those conferences? What would be the impact on the general population? That would be the reflective something or reflective uh, indicator of uh, where we are actually heading to. When it comes to contribution, uh, this is just a rough presentation. We know that India has been told, uh, I mean, called as diabetic, uh, you know, country of the world because of the the ranges that would uh, fluctuate over the period of time or decades with regards to stamping something as diabetes. But then again, we are having a major chunk of the global diabetes. We know the classification that would be pre-existing diabetes and gestational. Pre-existing one is type one and type two, and pre uh, gestational one would be again pre-existing or true GDM. When it comes to pre-existing, it is already present in pregnancy and meets the criteria for diabetes in non-pregnant state. Roughly, we would say that fasting more than 126 mg per deciliter, 2 hour postprandial after 75 mg would be more than 200 mg per deciliter, random sugar more than 200 and HbA1c more than 6.5%. Types, type 1 is autoimmune process that would destroy the pancreatic beta cells and type 2 would be lifestyle diabetes or maturity onset diabetes. When it comes to gestational diabetes, it is uh, something which is diagnosed after 24 weeks of gestation for the first time. That means if there is a uh, you know, sugar level which is normal before 24 weeks, we would stamp it as gestational diabetes. It may be a possibility that patient might be carrying that diabetes before as well. So we need to exclude that particular possibility as Dr. Mithali said that we need to actually screen all the females as soon as possible in pregnancy with regards to diabetes. GDM has majorly two types, type A1 where there will be abnormal OGTD but again normal blood glucose level in form of fasting as well as postprandial and diet modification would be enough for this kind of patients. When it comes to type A2, there will be abnormal OGTD and abnormal glucose levels in form of fasting as well as postprandial and that would require added insulin and medical therapy. This is very simple. Risk factors, uh, previous delivery of stillbirth baby, anomalous baby, large for gestational age babies, GDM in previous pregnancy, or even maternal side, BMI more than 27 before pregnancy. This is important, before pregnancy. How many patients would come before pregnancy for calculation of BMI? But this, this, there lies the importance of GPs even, where these patients would go even before pregnancy for some minor ailments. So BMI is very, very important. Age more than 35 years, diabetes in one of the first degree relatives, recurrent UTI, or fungal infection, again, which would indicate presence of diabetes, large for gestational age, excessive weight gain during pregnancy, and polyhydromnios with unknown cause. Pathogenesis, we, we have already seen in previous talk, but again, just to uh, summarize, there will be increased insulin resistance. When, whenever we teach uh, the physiological changes, we would say that pregnancy is a state 
which is called diabetogenic state because there will be fasting hypoglycemia and postprandial hyperglycemia. Why? Because these hormones would actually bind to the insulin receptors which would make insulin ineffective and that would not allow glucose to enter into the cells that would allow the glucose to roam around in the bloodstream and that would increase the blood glucose level. Very, very simple phenomenon. Now, this insulin resistance is normal uh, phenomenon in even in second trimester. That resistance keeps on increasing and in second trimester, it would be maximum. And that is why we are choosing that window of 24 to 28 weeks for OGTT if the previous measure is or uh, the reading is normal with regards to fasting glucose. Now, this again, uh, we talked that blood glucose level, level will be high. That will again lead to increased fetal level of insulin, but this insulin will not cross the placenta and that's that would impact the fetal tissues and all the other embryopathy would happen and now this growth stimulating effect because growth hormone is not responsible for fetal growth for fetal growth something that is important or responsible is insulin like growth factor so when insulin like growth factor and insulin increase that would lead to macrosomia this is as simple as that this is again uh, just fasting hypoglycemia in fasting state pregnant patient or female would be having accelerated starvation and exaggerated ketosis, maternal hypoglycemia, hypoinsulinemia because there will be no glucose, so insulin will not be secreted, hyperlipidemia and hyperketonemia. Now, what happens in fed state? There will be postprandial hyperglycemia. Now, due to that, there will be hyperinsulinemia and again, insulin will be quite ineffective and that would again keep on increasing insulin secretion and hyperlipidemia and reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin. So, pregnancy is diabetogenic state majorly for two reasons. One is increased insulin resistance and second one is degradation or faster degradation of insulin. The maternal complications are very well known. Just to uh, have the summary of it, during pregnancy there will be DKA, diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, hypoglycemia. During pregnancy there will be a lot of challenges in form of mis miscarriage or adverse pregnancy outcomes, maternal distress as well. During labor, there will be shoulder dystocia and a lot of more things, which would again actually increase the load on patient's body. And during puerperium, there will be lactational failure as well as puerperial sepsis. In fetus, as uh, discussed, Barker's hypothesis, which was uh, again linked with metabolic syndrome, previously known as syndrome X. Now, this is one thing where if there is increased insulin secretion in fetus, it actually leads to hypoglycemia and neonatal phase and that is why for next 24 to 48 hours we'll keep on monitoring neonatal glucose level and in childhood there are more chances of this baby to have obesity and impaired glucose tolerance which would again if not properly controlled or managed or monitored get converted into type 2 diabetes mellitus so uh, this is in rough if there is pre-existing diabetes with non-achievement of euglycemia. If there is euglycemia, we are not worried about it. But if it is pre-existing diabetes with non-achievement of euglycemia, the organogenesis, behavioral changes and anthropometric changes will be there in fetus. But if there is gestational diabetes mellitus, we are sure of organogenesis to be normal. And that is where the importance of at least first fasting glucose level lies or measurement of it lies in the first antenatal visit. When we talk about diagnosis or screening, it all starts with history. As we saw, the risk factors will be covered in history, followed by clinical examination and laboratory evaluation. HbA1c majorly reflects past three months of sugar level or status, but when it comes to pregnancy, we would say four to eight weeks. Past four to eight weeks of sugar level will be reflected in HbA1c. And if not available within past one year, these are the investigations we would like to advise. Fasting lipid profile, liver function test, spot urinary albumin, creatinine ratio, serum creatinine, GFR and thyroid stimulating hormone as well. So Figo says all the pregnant females need to be screened for diabetes at the earliest possible time of pregnancy. And why? We already know that. So what are the tests? There, are, uh, there is RBS. Previously, we used to rely on that a lot. Then fasting blood glucose, then 50 gram uh, GCT, and then 75 or even 100 gram of OGTT. And then other variations might be there in future as well. So when it comes to this, to avoid the confusion, the government of India has published this guideline, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in 2018, that universal testing of all pregnant females with single step procedure irrespective of the fasting status after administration of 75 gram of glucose is must. Now why? What, what would we need for that? Even a GP can do that. So we need to have a normal glucose pouch of 75 gram. There will be a measuring flask, 300 ml of distilled water, disposable glasses in form of a verified or calibrated glucometer, sterile lancet, cotton, 
not alcohol swab. Why? We'll see in the next slide. Yellow, red and black dustbins for discarding the material, puncture proof container and registration to record the results. When it comes to national guidelines, they said that testing of GDM is recommended twice during ANC period. The first at the earliest possible time. The second one, if the first one is negative, if the first one is negative, the second one needs to be done between 24 to 28 weeks. As we saw the second trimester or even this window is something where insulin resistance will be increasing. And that is why the second test will be done on 24 to 28 weeks and only as Dr. Mithali said, only one third of GDM positive patients will be reflected or get caught in first trimester screening. And that is why we need this 24 to 28 weeks of window. When it comes to testing, we know that third or fourth finger needs to be used, ring finger or middle finger, why? Because the thumb is very, very pulsatile. If you actually puncture it, it keeps on bleeding, maybe. The index finger will be more callous because it is more in use. The little finger has little of tissue that would actually damage or even, uh, you know, cause pain in bone level. And that is why the side of third finger or fourth finger needs to be used for this particular puncture. With regards to wiping of fingertip, it has to be done with sterile water. Alcohol swab must not be used because if you do not allow it to get dry, it will actually alter the results of RBS. And validation or calibration of glucometer is must. Eleunath Hishwakeke camp is there and you just simply use any of the glucometers. You need to have properly calibrated glucometer. So DIPSI criteria, we know that 75 gram of glucose in 300 ml of distilled water over the period of 5 minutes. Blood testing needs to be done after 2 hours. There will be rest for the female and she would not move around much. If she vomits within 30 minutes of administration, the test needs to be repeated next day or whenever early as possible. If she vomits after 30 minutes of the ingestion, the test stands valid. The advantage is no need of fasting, can be performed anytime, can be done by anybody uh, right from the GP level. If the blood values are more than or equal to 200 mg per deciliter, it will be reflective of diabetes mellitus. If it is 140 to 189, it is GDM. If it is 120 to 139, it is gestational glucose intolerance. And if it is less than 120, it is supposed to be normal. So this glucose monitoring is very, very important. Why? Because urine analysis and ketone bodies are not much reflective of, uh, as uh, with regards to the diagnosis of GDM. The fasting blood glucose is predictive of neonatal fetal mass and subsequent development of childhood obesity and diabetes, as we saw. One or postprandial level is predictive of better blood glucose control and subsequent development of LGA or even uh, more chances of cesarean section. And after stabilization of blood glucose, we need to keep on monitoring this particular uh, segment over the period of the next few trimesters. With regards to HbA1c, as we, as we know that in pregnancy, it reflects the duration or the glucose status of past four to eight weeks, not three months, four to eight weeks. This, this needs to be known and should be done in first antenatal evaluation as it serves the diagnostic tool for female with undiagnosed diabetes or even at risk of diabetes. When HbA1c is around 10 to 12 percent, there are approximately 25 percent of chances of fetus having major congenital malformations and that is why it is very very important to do hba1c if i want to summarize i would say that in first antenatal visit go for fbs or even rbs and if possible if they, they are normal then ogtt in form of 75 gram needs to be done if it is positive go ahead with uh, management as gdm if it is negative repeat it at 24 to 28 weeks and then if positive treat as gdm and negative then manage as normal anc so 24 to 28 weeks is very very crucial period with regards to pregnancy one step we already discussed if the patient has not been uh, is not been diagnosed as uh, having gdm 24 to 28 weeks is the duration where we would go seven, for 75 gram of OGTT. We would measure plasma glucose level at one and two hours. And these are the levels. If the patient exceeds them, it, she would be stamped as diabetes. With regards to two step, in four step, they would use 50 gram of glucose. Now, these are alternatives, alternatives to Dipsy. So 50 gram of glucose. And if the sugar level is more than or equal to 140 milligram of deciliter, we would go ahead for second step where we would administer 100 gram of OGTT. And these are the levels uh, beyond which the patient can be stamped as uh, GDM or having diabetes mellitus. Recommendations to simplify high risk characteristics of GDM should undergo OGTT as soon as feasible. And if negative, re if negative, if she is already diabetes, do not do OGTT between 24 to 28 weeks or else she would end up in having intrauterine fetal death. So do not repeat it if uh, she is already diagnosed to have GDM. With regards to fasting glucose level, if the, uh, the glucose levels are more than or equal to 126, she is to be stamped as pre-existing diabetes. If fasting glucose is between 92 to 126, she is supposed to have 75 gram of OGTT. If fasting glucose is less than 92, then she needs to repeat the test at 24 to 28 weeks for 75 gram OGTT. And these are the levels with regards to two hours 
75 फाइव ग्राम ओजिटिटी फॉर ऑल फीमेल्स नॉट प्रीवियसली डायग्नोज टू हैव डायबिटिस मलाइटस सो फ्यूचर रिसर्च एक्चुअली रिक्वायर्स कॉमन जेनेटिक बैकग्राउंड बिकॉज जी डी एम इज समथिंग विच इफ नॉट कंट्रोल इफ द यू ग्लाइसेमिया स्टेटस इज नॉट मेंटेन वुड शिफ्ट द पेशेंट टू टाइप टू डायबिटिस मलाइटस एट द अर्लीस्ट फीमेल्स विद प्रीवियस जी डी एम एंड जी डी एम डिस्प्ले द सेम एल एलिस एसोसिएटेड विद हाई रिस्क फॉर टाइप टू डायबिटिस पोस्ट नेटल मेडिकेशन इन फीमेल्स विद प्रीवियस जी डी एम मेटफॉर्मिन इज फाउंड टू बी एक्सिलेंट एंड इफ आई मीन मेजोरिटी ऑफ यू नो दैट मेटफॉर्मिन इज नाउ सपोज टू एक्चुअली लेंथन द लाइफ ऑफ ह्यूमन्स सो नाउ इट इज बींग सर्च फॉर दैट एज वेल there is an interesting book uh, known as outlive you try to read it and metformin is now going to be used for that particular purpose as well fetal monitoring we know that uh, we need to undergo i mean have the monitoring in form of clinical examination fetal heart uh, sound then fetal movement count after 28 weeks majorly and uh, all other test with regards to fetus the first trimester sonography we call it as dating scan because it is as accurate as plus or minus 3 days variation second trimester is known as anomaly scan again diabetic and those patients having cardiac diseases would be very much focused for that third trimester is again growth scan where there will be a little bit of more variation but only 22% of fetuses which were diagnosed to have lga by sonography had actually macrosomia now this is the glitch where it lies if we keep on focusing on usd for lga babies we would actually end up in increasing rates of cesarean section falsely so just 22% of fetuses diagnosed to have lga were having macrosomia with regards to diabetic mothers and this is the explanation the accuracy of fetal growth monitoring is only within 15% and significant error existed between usd diagnosis and actual birth weight at the time of birth thank you thank you so much